Invent the wheel. Now, those those of us who are old, older, <laughs> those of us who are mature, <laughs> with life experience. Season. Okay. You see, I can't pick on anybody now because I never think I'm calling them old. Marty! <laughs> Anyways, I pick you because in talking to you, you have a lot of life experience. You've seen a lot, you've dealt with people, right? I run a business. I hire young people all the time, uh, anywhere between 19 and 23. Uh, you deal with any of the people in that age bracket at all? Yeah. Can they be frustrated? Yes. What? Well, because they don't know what their job is. You know, the, the nice thing about supervising people that know their job uh -huh. is you're to serve them to make sure they get what they need, but they're also to serve you. Yes. So you protect each other. One of the things we used to say is the best way to make a supervisor fail is to do exactly what he says. <laughs> but we were talking with people that were knowledgeable people about what they were doing. Right. The problem that you have with young people like that is they think they know what they're doing, but they don't. Now, there you go. Young people, I understand this. Not picking on you, I'm just telling you a fact of life. And that is, in your youth, uh, you think, and you think that what you're thinking is actually right and correct. And you have now the youth, the energy, and the bravado to back that up. The problem is, is that you don't have the life experience. I hire you for work, and, and I run a lawn crew. We cut grass. It doesn't take a rocket science to warn a, a meteor or an edger. But you would be surprised at how much knowledge it does take to do that and how many people get it wrong. Okay? Because they come in with the idea of it's just it's just running a stick as you I can get a monkey to do that, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, no. Life experience. These guys, they, they think they have life figured out, but you ask them how a checkbook works and, and they just got a blank. How do I get a loan? Blank face. What happens when the pipe under the sink breaks and I got water all over the house? What happens when my young wife who's pregnant tells me that her water broke? What do I do? Here's a great one. Ladies, remember your first baby? You got a commercial on this, the first baby. Man, you want to touch that baby, you better head to toe with, uh, you know, uh, what is that stuff called? Disinfectant. There you go. There you go. Uh, second baby, eh, you just hand that baby off to anybody. <laughs> There's something to be said about life experience. And listen, not just in your day-to-day -day worldly life, but there is something to be said about experience when it comes to your spiritual life. Who do you want to learn from God from? Somebody who just gave their heart to Him? Or a seasoned, mature Christian? There's a reason why the Bible says to listen and submit to your elders because they've walked with God. They understand how this battle is played out. They know it well. They have a lifetime of experience with it, and they have a lot to share. In your marriage, when you first got married, did you have everything figured out? Come on now, when you first got married, you said, yes, I got it all figured out. This is going to be easy. That was before reality set in, right? And within about the second year, reality has hit you like a sledgehammer. And by the third year, you're wondering, who is it that I married? <laughs> and it's probably not even then, it's just life that happens, right? The responsibilities of now having a household, of having to pay all these bills, of whether you know how to handle money and they know how to handle money, or you both don't know how to handle money, or one does and one doesn't. The fact that you actually see each other, 
every day. That can be a good thing or a bad thing. Maturity. So when you're young in your marriage, do you want to learn from somebody else who's young in your marriage? Or do you want to go to somebody who's had a marriage that's lasted 10, 20, 30, 50, 60 years? Listen, when I joined the church, this was the first time I ever was around a group of people who the majority of them were still with their first spouses. Never seen that before. The fact that there were some really mature saints there, that they were married for 50, 60 years. And I learned from them. Because after about the third year of marriage, I was wondering, well, can I still do this? How? 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 And they showed me. And the key to it was submitting to your spouse. Marriage isn't about getting your needs met. It is about you meeting the needs of your spouse. And if you and your spouse have that same mindset, your marriage will work. If it's based on Jesus Christ. Amen. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you. Not just the young. All of you. Be submissive to who? This, brothers and sisters, is how a church family or any family will work. And that is, is that you submit to each other. That you put their needs ahead of your own. That you put their wants ahead of your own. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists what? But gives grace to the humble. Why does God resist the proud? Did you hear what she said? You can ask my wife. It, it, it doesn't matter what aspect of life it is, whether it's my business, whether it's dealing with church people, whether it's dealing with my children. I have a very low tolerance for arrogance. Actually, I have no tolerance for arrogance. But you know, it's really hard to have no tolerance for arrogance when you're an arrogant person. <laughs> you, know who, you know who told me that? So I never realized that. I could see everybody else's arrogance until my wife told me. <laughs> that's why God gives you a wife. <laughs> and women, that's why God gives you a husband. They get to tell you those things that you just can't see yourself. Right, right? Right? So, why is it that you have a low tolerance in other people and something that you're really able to tolerate very well in yourself? This is where I'll stop. Each one of you is on a path and each one of you is going to decide where that path is going to lead. You, out of your own choices, will decide whether that path, whether that road will lead to heaven, or whether it will lead to hell. If you choose, you understand what I'm saying? If you choose heaven, God is there and has done everything already to make sure you get there. If you choose that, and it is a choice that happens day by day. And it is seen in the choices that you make day by day. Whether you're on the uphill climb or whether you're on the downhill slide. It's seen in the choices that you make every day. The question is, is what do you want your final destination to be? Outside of young people. I've never heard an old person say, yeah, I really want to go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> Have you? What's that? They always say, I want to go to hell and see all my friends here. Where do you want to go? Where do you want to wind up? What do you want your life to be about? In the end, 
It's only two destinations. You, 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 you're either going to be with God or you're not. The choice is yours, right? Jesus Christ has given everything. There is nothing more that God could have given that He did not give in His Son, Jesus Christ. When the Spirit of Prophecy tells you that He poured out all of heaven and all of its gifts and all of its treasures in Jesus Christ, think about what that means. Nobody raised their hand when I asked them if they were sinless. That means that you are honest enough to know that in the course of your day-to-day -day living, you offend God. I offend God. And God is still going to save us if we confess those sins and accept Jesus Christ and submit to Him. What kind of God is that? It's the kind of God I want to be with throughout eternity. Amen. Closing hymn is number 469.